Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to today's cooking class. I am Stephanie Jordan. I'm the local food program manager here at Sustainable Solano. And I'm really excited to welcome our guest chef today, Andrea Nightingale, who is the chef and owner of Mortal Mortar Pestle Cooking. Some tongue twister there. <laughs> so welcome, Chef Andrea. We're really glad to have you with us today. This class is one of many that Sustainable Solano is doing over the next year or year and a half or so, I would say, to raise awareness of a lot of our local, um, local farms and wonderful local food that is grown here in Solano County. Uh, the focus is generally on specialty crops. And if you've been with us before, you know that those are fruit, vegetables, tree nuts, and culinary herbs. So a lot of these recipes that we're doing in this series are rather plant-based um, and focus on those crops. And this series is also part of Sustainable Solano's larger vision to build a more resilient and robust local food system here in Solano County. And you can find out a lot more about this initiative and our other programs and projects um, around local food systems on our website, which is sustainablesolano.org. And let me just make sure here, there's anybody else in the waiting room before we keep going here. Okay, I'm flying solo here <laughs> with Andrea. Um, so if you've been to our cooking classes before, you know that we talk a lot about the different agricultural regions here in the county and some of the different um, areas. And so I just want to take a moment to acknowledge and honor the indigenous people who have stewarded these lands for generations. The unceded territory of California is home to nearly 200 tribal nations. And so I'm going to invite you to check out a map, which I will post in the chat shortly, so that you can learn a little bit more about where you live as well. Um, so I will get to that in a second. And just a couple housekeeping items before we start. Um, I will spotlight Andrea once she gets going, but in the meantime, you might want to shift your view to speaker view, which will help you to not see all these little boxes all over the screen. Um, and also for questions, feel free to put questions in the chat as we go along. I will relay them at the end during our question and answer session with Chef Andrea. Um, or you may use the raise hand button, in which case I will unmute you and then you can talk directly to Andrea um, and get questions answered that way. So today, Chef Andrea is doing a very multifaceted dish with a lot of different components. Um, it's kind of exciting. So she's doing a salt roasted beets with pickled cherries, creamy roasted zucchini puree and lemon olive oil dressed spinach. So I'm gonna share my screen right now and just show you guys, the recipe. So here it is. <clears throat> so this is available on our website, again, sustainablesalon.org. Um, if you go to the local food section and uh, then to the recipes, you will find this. So this is a two-page document with lots of different components and parts. This is actually similar to what a restaurant chef would actually have when it comes to, you know, developing these dishes. There's a lot of little pieces and parts that get done separately and then it all gets assembled at the end. So there is that. Um, and I'm hoping that this recipe also went out to those of you who registered. I attempted to send, um, send that link to everyone who registered on Eventbrite uh, yesterday. So hopefully that got into your hands as well. Um, so Andrea is coming to us from South Lake Tahoe today. She also works around Napa Sonoma and I'm gonna let her talk about uh, an opportunity to see her in Solano County, hopefully in September. So we'll get, uh, we'll have her mention that too. And I think that's about it for me. So again, welcome Chef Andrea. Uh, before you get cooking, please tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're up to in the culinary world and then take it away. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Stephanie. I have to say all of you are sitting on top of three cake plates on the other side of my um, kitchen counter right here and it feels like you're just in my house for a dinner party so that's kind of fun. Um, I um, am Andrea. I live in South Lake Tahoe but I lived in Napa um, for about 10 years and cooked in a lot of different restaurants all over the country um, and have my own um, 
personal chef business called Mortar Pestle Cooking, which I launched about four years ago. And I really love working with the small farmers, with um, vegetables, with all the produce that's in season. So I was really excited to get to partner with Sustainable Solano for this recipe and or multiple recipes, as Stephanie pointed out. Um, so please feel free to ask any and all questions because I love answering questions and helping you guys um, you know, develop as cooks. It's just too much fun to cook with all this beautiful produce. So um, I think I'm gonna get started here. And I will say that the biggest challenge that I think a lot of um, home cooks and even professional chefs face is time management. And so when you have a, a dish like this and you're trying to assemble multiple pieces, I always think about what takes the longest and get that thing going first and then kind of keep moving down the line. So the thing that takes the longest on this today is the salt roasted beets. And um, I was really lucky. I picked these up at the farmer's market and they still have their tops on them and they're just beautiful. And a lot of times people don't know exactly what to do with beet tops. And so this isn't in the recipe, this is kind of a bonus, but um, we can add these to our spinach later in our dish and then um, we can eat them that way. But you can also saute them. Um, sometimes I'll saute them and mix them with ricotta and do like a, um, a filling for um, uh, like for ravioli um, or make a pesto out of them. There are just all kinds of things you can do. So if you are lucky enough to get pretty tops with your beets or turnips or radishes, um, please don't throw them away. <laughs> Okay, so these guys, this is for salt roasting and it's gonna feel like a lot of salt. I lost my earpiece here. Okay. Um, but I will always um, keep my salt and reuse it, but I cannot begin to describe how unctuous and delicious these beets are when they're cooked in this method. And this isn't a method developed by me, this is just a you know, I don't know who developed this method, but it's been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. And basically you take up to a whole box of kosher salt and you take your beets, you rinse them off. And then I like to use these um, bread um, baking dishes because they hold everything in place really well. And then you just think, cover it entirely like that. And then we're gonna put it in the oven. And then when it comes out, um, you can save the salt and reuse it. So you can just keep reusing that salt so you don't have to buy a whole thing of salt every single time you want to um, make these, make this. So this is going in the oven, but through the magic of Zoom television, I have some beets that are already done um, right here. But I have one here that still needs to be peeled. And um, when your beets are cooked all the way through, you, it's really easy to peel them. You just um, flip it off with a paper towel or a towel like this. And then that's it. That's really simple. But if your beets are not cooked all the way, your skin will fight with you and you'll be like really frustrated and say, why isn't this coming off? And then you'll remember and then you'll put it back in the oven again, or you'll just use a knife or a veggie peeler and kind of peel it. But, um, so I'm just gonna cut that guy and then, oh, I forgot my blender. Um, and then you're going to just puree these all in a blender. And I'm so sorry, because I actually left my blender in the other room, which is... No worries. <laughs> I knew I was forgetting something, but the blending process is pretty straightforward. I think you guys probably all have a blender or a food processor will work. Just anything that gets this nice and smooth and it's pretty simple you just put everything in there 
and um, I always put a pinch of salt and um, just a little bit of some olive oil to kind of get it going. And then I'll always have just a little bit of water on the side because sometimes it doesn't really move and you you need it to um, to start getting smoother. So you you add a little bit of that water and that'll help it along. This is gonna be loud. And then that's it. Um, you just want to get it pretty smooth. I could even get it smoother than this, but you don't need to sit there and watch me puree beets forever. And um, the biggest thing here is to taste it and make sure that you like the way it tastes. Because if you don't like it, no one else will. And, um, you know, I like that. So you're going to set that aside. And that's going to be the base of our dish. And if you have leftover beet puree, which you probably will, you can add it into um, chickpeas and you can make a beet hummus with it, which is really delicious. You could make, um, you could add some to pasta dough and you could make like a beet pasta dough. Um, and then on the recipe that Stephanie mentioned, I have um, other things that you can do with all of these dishes so that you don't, you're not um, there with just like all this beet puree and then you're like, what do I do with this? So um, let's see. Andrea, someone's asking um, what the huh. cooking in the salt does, I guess, as opposed to roasting. Oh. Does it make the beets Great. The hold water or um, or does it infuse a little bit of the salt into the beets so they have more flavor? What's your take on that? That's an amazing, wonderful question. And what it does is um, as the beet cooks, it releases the water and then all of the salt surrounding those beets get hard. And so it creates this little like cocoon for the beets to cook inside of. And then it, it essentially gets steamed but it's steamed with salt flavored steam. So the beet, a lot of people are concerned that it'll be really, really salty, but you, you don't really taste the salt. It's just a very lightly seasoned um, dish and it roasts a little bit. Um, it, it, the texture comes out like a little bit more meaty. Um, I find then when you just simply boil it or steam the beets or something. So for a lot of people who love meat, but don't really like, vegetables as much. This is a great beet thing to serve them. And you can also slice them very thin and you can put them um, like down on your plate like they're a carpaccio and then just drizzle a little olive oil, salt and pepper, and then put like an arugula salad or something with that. And it's really delicious. Um, so I hope that answers your question. That was a great question. Okay, so the next thing, sorry, I have to clean as I go here because we need the blender again in a little bit. Um, okay. So the next thing that is going to take the most time is our um, zucchini puree. And this is one of my favorite things. I was working as a chef in um, Napa at this winery brewery garden and um, we had all of this beautiful produce in our garden. And um, we had all these zucchinis and I was trying to come up with uses for them because we had to serve everything in these jars um, because of the health department. And I came up with this zucchini puree and I kind of just loved it so much and it's almost cheesy tasting. Um, so it's a really great thing that you can also put, oh my gosh, I'm sorry, I just realized that you're not pureeing those beets at all. I'm having a, a brain stop. I'm so sorry, you guys. You're gonna think I'm like a total dip here. 
Um, so don't puree your beets if you're cooking. <laughs> um, you're actually going to cut those beets up and we're going to serve them that way. I can't believe I just said that. I'm so embarrassed. I'm really sorry, you guys. The zucchini is the puree that we're doing. Oh my gosh, Stephanie, you're never going to. No, no Call worries. Me back again. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fired. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> You're fine. <laughs> oh my god, I can't believe that. Um. Anyway, I'm having a bond moment today. You guys, just bear with me. Um. So this squash puree, you can make it, and um, and you can put it like on pasta. Um. Again, you can mix it with like chickpeas and make like a type of hummus with it. Um, but we're going to actually put it as base of the dish. And all you do is you just cut your zucchini and your onions and your garlic really thin. And I have some already done here as well. And you just throw it all in the pan together so it's really easy. Um, and then you just slowly roast it and until it basically is just falling apart. And then at that point, that's when you're going to go ahead and puree it. So I'm just doing that. And then um, for a little bit of acidity, you can, if you have some white wine kicking around the kitchen that you're not going to use, you can use that um, instead of the lemon. But most of most people, especially in California, have lemons. So um, you just take this lemon and slice it really thin. This is a mandolin, and um, you can get these like really thin cuts from it. But if you don't have that, you can just use your sharp knife. Um, but I'm just gonna throw these guys in there, taking the seeds out. and just give it a little bit of a toss. And then I'm gonna put the lid on it and that's just gonna go in the oven and just roast um, until it's done. Andrea, just to recap, you have the zucchini, the onions, I saw you put a little garlic in there and the lemon. Uh, and the uh, lemon and slices. butter. Butter, why and not? And well, I love butter, but if you're doing this for vegan, for vegan eater, you could put a little, um, just the olive oil would be great. Or you could put a little tiny bit of coconut butter in there, which has just such a luxurious, um, buttery type character to it, or some vegan butter as well. Okay. So that's going, that's going. Um, one thing that's really important, I think I've said it before, but always cleaning up in between tasks. It's something that a lot of um, cooks can get very easily flustered if you're doing a lot of different components and you have a lot of different things going on. But if you always, I had a chef and he always said, make a mess, clean a mess. He made me repeat it because I was a very messy cook in the early days. Um, but that's just like a little pro tip. It's really going to help you be more calm and less flustered in the kitchen. Okay, so now we're moving on to our pickled cherries. And um, these things are delicious and they're so good. If you ever do like a cheese and charcuterie board, you could put those on there. They're really tasty with duck. Um, or poultry that you've roasted and you could just kind of finish them on there. They're great tossed in a salad. Um, so when you make them, they last for quite a, a couple of weeks, at least in your fridge. And so, you know, if you make a big batch, it's not like they're gonna go to waste right away. So these are fun. And then the liquid, when you're done with all your cherries, you can strain it and, um, and then add it with some fizzy water. And it's a really refreshing, kind of like a shrub um, kind of drink because there's a lot of vinegar in there. So I'm just cutting these cherries. If you have a cherry pitter, you could use that as well. 
I just use my thumb here and pull this pits out. And then I have fingers that make me look like I'm a winemaker. <laughs> because winemakers always have those stained fingers at harvest. Okay. So, sorry, I can't lose my earpiece. All right, so these guys just go in and this is a very easy brine to make. So I have some water here that I've boiled. And so I add, like one, it's gonna be like a one to three sort of ratio. So about one part of my red wine vinegar. And then to that, I'm gonna add this water that's boiling or it, it was just boiling. And then I've got some star anise here. I'm gonna pop in some dried hibiscus. This stuff is so delicious. You can get it at your local Mexican market, or I think a lot of the farmers in the area are growing hibiscus even, that the, or roselle, and then they dry it, and that's what this is, and it's so good. And then um, some sugar, just to taste. You don't want a lot because the cherries themselves are already sweet. And then some salt. And then we're just going to mix it up. You just want to dissolve all of those ingredients. And then some herbs. Um, I've got here tarragon. And then these are um, anise hyssop leaves. I'm growing them. So they're like huge because they've been growing in my greenhouse. But um, I'm sure that there are a lot of farmers in the area that grow this in the summertime. The blossoms are really delicious as a garnish. Um, and these greens, you can make kind of like a tea out of them. And they have this like very like subtle kind of licorice flavor. Um, so I think it goes really nicely with the, with the cherries. So I always taste it. It's, you know, vinegar brine, so that's good. It's tart, it should be tart. It should be a little sweet, just a little tiny bit salty. Um, and then that's it for this guy. And it just kind of hangs out and that's it. So you can see how easy that was to make. How long do you let it sit? Until it cools to room temperature. And then, I mean, at, at minimum. And then, you know, so that's usually about like 20 minutes or so, 20, 30 minutes. And then, you know, it can, it just, the cherries just take on more of that flavor, of course, the longer they sit. We're actually kind of cruising right through here. Um, does anyone have any other questions about anything? Yeah, there were some questions here. Um, okay. Someone's wondering about the, back to the beets, um, about how yeah. much salt would you use for just two or three beets? I'm thinking if you had them maybe in like a little loaf pan or something that's kind of small and boxy. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you basically just want to completely cover them. So, um, so probably like at least a couple of cups up to like two to four cups, kind of depending on, um, you know, kind of depending on that. It depends that on, yeah, I'd say it probably yeah. depends on the size of your beets for one thing and just, you know, your container, but. Um, exactly. Yeah, a box of Morton kosher salt. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I would say it. to, exactly. I'd say to be safe, just get a box of kosher salt. And then, um, and then you can just keep that salt in a Ziploc or a, or a jar or something, um, and then just keep reusing it. I'll pass it through a strainer to get like the clumps out because it gets kind of clumpy after the beets have gone in there. And you can get at least at least three to four good salt roasts out of that same salt. So, you know, I think that's pretty good. You don't want to have to buy a big box of salt every time you're going to roast beets. But. 
<laughs> right, right. Good. Mm -hmm. um, there was another question or two about the zucchini. So somebody's wondering if you have to put it in the oven or if you can just mm. um, cover it and put it on the stove top and just let it kind of do a simmer, you know? Yeah, if you definitely can. It does not have to go in the oven. I was making use of the oven because I have the beets in there already. Um, and then also I'm using the stove top just for this purpose, but yeah, you could definitely do it. Um, you know, the, the whole goal is just that the zucchini is so like tender that it just really falls apart. And that way, when you puree it, it purees really smoothly. So however you can achieve that is fine. Okay, great. Um, another question was, could you use some avocado oil in with the Ab zucchini? Absolutely. Yeah, you could really use any fat that you want. Um, as long as you like the way it tastes, then I say do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see, the pickled cherries. Uh, how long would those last in the refrigerator once you've got them done? Yeah, I've definitely kept some in my fridge for like at least a couple of weeks. They usually don't last longer than that, to be honest, because I eat them on a lot of stuff. Um, but they'll be fine. It's a very um, acidic uh, liquid, so so they'll you know, and they're pickled, so they pre that's the preservation process. So they they last for longer than just a couple of days. Right. And on the um, on the same topic of the cherries, someone's wondering about uh, using other vinegar, like um, a, a white vinegar. Let's see here. Could you use it? Could you use any other vinegar for the cherries, other red wine, such as regular white vinegar? I think that was the question. I would, I could, yes, I would say use any vinegar you want. Um, I'm, I am gonna just say though that I think that, um, I said that and I'm immediately editing what I just said. Um, balsamic vinegar, I, I wouldn't use, that's more of a special vinegar for finishing and it's so viscous, I don't think it would really, bring much to the table here. However, there is a white balsamic vinegar that I've found like at Trader Joe's, um, which you could use, which is a little bit more, um, it's lighter and it's not, it's not that same kind of intensity. Um, and then if you were using this straight up distilled vinegar, um, I would be really careful just to test and taste your seasoning um, with your sugar and salt and everything to make sure that it it's really the flavor that you want. But otherwise, yeah, I say experiment and like um, like a champagne vinegar would be really nice. A white wine vinegar certainly. Um, uh, what else? Apple cider I think would probably be fun to try. I say go for it. Let your imagination take you away. <laughs> right. All right. One more question about the cherries. They're wondering if there's a substitute for the anise hyssop. Yeah, so I put the tarragon in there because that's the closest. Mm -hmm. And if you cannot find tarragon, um, which sometimes it's challenging to find, don't worry about it. You can just do that, um, just the star anise, the dried little star anise, which are easier to find. And they really just bring a little licorice kind of backbone. So fennel seeds would work as well. Or, in, you know, there's a ton of wild fennel growing everywhere. You could just clip some of those wild fennel blossoms and throw that in. That would be delicious. Um, yeah. And if you don't like licorice or that licorice flavor, which a lot of people don't, then just take, you don't want that in there anyway. So <laughs> you would just leave that out. You could put a bay leaf in or something instead. Yeah, that's true. Okay. Um, I think that those are all the questions for now. Oh, when you were talking about the hibiscus, I was thinking about um, giving a little plug to Morning Sun Herb Farm. Oh, you know, I love them. Yeah, they might have hibiscus <laughs> and a lot of these herbs and spices that we're discussing. Yeah. I feel like, I, you know, if, if Rose doesn't have it, I, nobody will. So if any yeah. of you are near Vacaville, check out Morning Sun Herb Farm on Pleasance Valley Road. I have bought almost all of my herbs from them in like historically over the years. And I've definitely purchased Roselle. And they have so they actually have a lot of different kinds of hyssops, not just the anise, but um, that's all of you need to go there, drop what you're doing you now <laughs> and go over there this weekend because they have the most amazing herb selection. It's, their scented geraniums are so beautiful and there's a lot you can do. This 
is kind of an aside, but with those scented geraniums, you can infuse them into ice creams or different cream sauces, panna cottas, things like that. Um, anyway, I just got excited for all of you getting to go there because it's such a, <laughs> it's such a magical place. <laughs> okay. Well, let me just check on this stuff here. Yeah, I'm actually going to bring these up to the stovetop just for the sake of time because they're, they're definitely taking a little bit longer in the oven. And we've been cruising through so quickly that I expected to have more time here. Um, but we're actually almost kind of almost done with these recipes. Um, so I'm just adding a little bit of liquid because it's on the stove and I wanna kind of help it steam a little bit faster. Put this back on. I'm so curious if um, many of our viewers out there um, cook with beets very often or cook with these ingredients a lot or what kind of things they make with them. Good question. Okay. Feel free to put into the chat, folks. <laughs> <laughs> what do you like to um, make with all these things? <clears throat> Everyone is very excited to try the salt roasted beets. There are oh, few good. comments about um, trying that method. Um, I haven't done it in a really long time, probably like 20 years. I tend to just kind of throw them in a pan and put some foil over and just roast them kind of the standard roasting method. But yeah. I like that idea because they get that little salt crust and it's kind of like, uh, you know, the steaming and the roasting kind of at the same mm -hmm. time, which is, which is cool. It is. Um, oh, I, yes. Um, Never <laughs> I have a friend who I taught that method to and she has like never looked back now. She's like cooking them like that all the time, which is really exciting. So yeah, I think it's one of those things too where you can cook a lot of beets, like even more than one bunch, just do as much as you can. And then just, you've got them in your fridge, um, you know, for whenever you, for whenever you want a beet. <laughs> yeah, um, and they do, they do keep um, very well. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you do buy them, um, you know, I tend to, I mean, when I get them from in my CSA boxes, they're usually just kind of on the loose. So sometimes I just put them in, you know, a plastic bag with some paper towel just to absorb any extra liquid. But I mean, they'll keep for three weeks, four weeks. I feel like they just kind of, they're, they're very hardy. So if you buy them and are not quite prepared to do anything with them right away, don't mm -hmm. be afraid to just stash them and then come back to them. So absolutely. Yeah. Yes, there's a lot of feedback here on the beets. Some people love pickled beets. Someone grew up around a lot of Russian cooking and beets are a mainstay in Russia. Yes. <laughs> um, let's see here. Everybody's excited to try the salt roasting. Uh, someone else says they bake them with tarragon, lemon, salt, and pepper, mm, add a little I'm raspberry so vinegar, but they want to try something new. Um, chives, yeah, they pair well with chives and the raspberry vinegar. Mm. Mm -hmm. That sounds delicious. Um, um, yeah. So cool. So um, I am going to move into the spinach, which is kind of our finishing component. And you can buy, I think, I'm, of course, as you've all witnessed, my brain isn't functioning at full speed today. The farm across from Morning Sun, Stephanie, what is? Yeah, what is um, it? it's, uh, I, I'm thinking of Soul Food Farm. Yes, yeah, Soul Food Farm. I think that they might have um, a lemon olive oil, but they definitely have delicious olive oil. And um, so if you could get like a, an olive oil that, where the olive and the lemon rind are crushed at the same time. It's called an ag um, which is the Italian term for it. But that, if you ever see that, that's what that is. 
Um, and those are just heavenly olive oils that are infused with these like essential oils from like lemon, lemon or other kinds of citrus. Um, but if you can't find that, um, you can still use one of those beautiful olive oils and just add lemon zest to it. And you get a really quick kind of lemon olive oil. And then um, you can keep that, you know, for as long as you're gonna use it. It probably won't last very long because it's so delicious. So um, I actually have a lemon olive oil already, but I'm, just to demo it, I'm gonna add a little bit of that lemon zest and um, for this particular dish, you don't really need that much of it um, because you're really just kind of lightly dressing the, um, the spinach. But there's that. And then, you know, it's pretty simple. It's just lemon zest and olive oil. But that can just hang out. You know, that's something you could do like in advance, days ahead of time. It'll keep for a long time. Um, it's a nice thing if you were doing, again, like a cheese board or something, if you have friends coming over or just like an auntie pasty dinner night, um, you know, you could put some of that over some like young fresh cheeses, like a burrata, mozzarella, goat's milk cheese, like a fresh one, um, or just have it like to dip your bread into. It's really delicious that way. You know, unless of course you're around someone who doesn't like lemons and then I don't know, maybe you can't help them there. <laughs> but, um, and so you didn't add any lemon juice to that, right? It's just the zest and the olive oil, kind of like a little just, infusion? Yeah, I just did a little infusion with just the olive oil and the zest. But right when we dress it, I'm going to add some of the juice over the top of the greens. Got it. And then, I am just going to shift in on these. So I've made it so that all the stems are facing that direction. So that way I just can like cut up to where the stem is and then I'm done. So I don't have to like take the stem off of every single leaf and then go through because, you know, it takes a long time to do that. And then to chiffonade, which some of you may be familiar with this technique already or this cut, but I basically just wrap them all up um, and I, find the largest leaf and put those on the outside and then I just roll it up and then I just start cutting super super thin and just making my way down the line here like this. Um, a lot of people will chiffonade basil and mint um, as herbs because they're so strong. And it's a nice way to um, kind of be a little bit more gently handed when you put those herbs into a dish. Anyway, there we go. This is something too, um, you could definitely like, if you just had a piece of toast and you could put like some ricotta cheese with some of, or like fresh goat's milk cheese or something with some of this um, lemon olive oil on top and then just put like a little dollop of these greens right on top of that. That would be really delicious. I don't know if you guys are the same way, but when I'm cooking one dish, I'm always thinking about how I can use these ingredients in other dishes too. <laughs> okay, so there are our greens and because we have these pretty, pretty beet greens, I'm gonna snag some of them and add them to the mix here. So the beet greens, you're gonna throw in raw, right? With your spinach? Yeah, and they're super thin. So, um, you know, that if they were too thick, I, I wouldn't, have probably chosen to do that because they can be a little bit tough and chewy to eat raw. Um, but when they're like really thin like that, it makes it a little bit easier. Okay. So we've got these. And um, I'm just gonna check on our zucchini situation.
So it's still a little bit underdone, but for the purposes of time, I'm just going to go ahead and demo the puree of it, which I mean, you guys know how to puree something, but I'm just going to show you anyway, so we can put this dish together. I love that you've got the yellow zucchini. I feel like the colors on this when you plate it up are gonna be really fantastic. <laughs> it is, you know, I actually did a dinner the other night um, and I had this as the base and they had um, halibut on top of it and it was really pretty and it was so delicious. Um, it's just like such a great, you know, especially if someone grows zucchini, there's always like a ton of zucchini of one plant. But this yellow one is so cheery. It just looks like summery sunshine to me. Okay. So there we are. We're going to puree this guy. Okay. So now we get to put everything together, which is the best part. Um, check on our beets real fast. Um, so one way to check on the beets, let's see, what did I do with it? Um, you know, a long toothpick are great. This is a cake tester. Every cook I've ever known has like a thousand of these things because sometimes you lose them really easily, but they, um, this one just lives right by my oven here. And it's like the best way to just stick you know, kind of stick it in and see if, you know, your cake is done obviously, but like for the beet. So I'm looking for this to go through and come back out without any um, resistance. And um, in this instance, you can see where the beets are on the side of the dish, which is one of the reasons why I like having these glass Pyrex for this purpose. Um, so this, this still isn't done, but because I messed up and pureed all the beets that were supposed to be the main course, I'm just gonna pretend like this is done. And then you guys can like imagine with me that this is done. So I can show you what this dish is supposed to look like. And I still can't believe that I did that. Okay, so I'm just going to puree these, or I'm not pureeing it, sorry. Um, I'm just peeling it. And I'm just using this towel, and it's not really coming off because, um, because the beets aren't cooked all the way. Are you guys, Stephanie, are there any other questions while I'm I will look here. Um, somebody is sharing a beet grass recipe. <laughs> so we've got a lot of sharing going on here, which is really fun. Oh, um, and some comments about the beet greens. Um, 
Yeah, there, somebody knows a local grocer who trims the beets and gives the greens to somebody for free. <laughs> so oh, awesome. lucky you. Yeah, I, I like to saute them up with a variety of other things. They're great with kale and collards or whatever. Um, yeah, so no additional questions. However, um, I do want to just mention that there is a new farm who is taking CSA subscriptions right now, and they know Andrea. Um, it's Umbel Roots. Do you want to tell us about, about them, Andrea? Yeah, I love these guys so much. Um, I actually was buying um, produce from, so William and Tom are the two farmers. And William had kicking bull farms um, in Sonoma, uh, in Carneros on the Sonoma County side. Um, and then just recently started with um, William Henpen and then Tom Inners is his partner and they just started this farm up in Sassoon Valley just this year. Um, and so they're doing CSA boxes or subscriptions. And I will tell you that not only are they absolutely delightful people, William was a chef and then a sommelier and Tom has a background in wine as well. And now the two of them are farmers. Um, they're very dedicated to uh, their farming practices and um, their biodynamic and um, they're just like awesome. They're the, some of the coolest people and their produce is so beautiful. I did an event in Sonoma just a, um, about a month ago and I got strawberries, their first strawberries from there. The entire, it was a four day long event. People would not stop talking about the strawberries. They were like the best strawberries anyone had ever had in their lives. Like you've never had a strawberry before. These, I still dream about them. So what they're doing is really special. And if you um, are looking to join a CSA, I honestly cannot say enough good things about them and the quality of, of their produce is beautiful. I've been using it for years and I'm always really, really proud to do that. And in September, we're gonna have, um, well, it's just in the works here, but we're planning a farm dinner um, in September. So everything will come from that farm or um, one of the neighboring farms if we can't get it from there. So um, stay tuned for that because that's gonna be a lot of fun and I'll be cooking and I won't forget to keep the beets whole, <laughs> I, I promise. <laughs> no worries. Um, people were asking about CSA. So yeah, somebody answered it. It's community supported agriculture and it's basically a relationship between you, the subscriber and a farm. Um, typically the farmer will deliver weekly to a specific location where you just go and pick up. Um, and then there's like a prearrangement for payment. So for example, I have my credit card on file at Eatwell Farm in Dixon. And then every Wednesday I go to a specific location and I pick up my box from, from Eatwell. Um, some farms have add-ons where they partner with other farms around them to offer more than just their main crop or their main ingredients. So in the case of Eatwell, they grow um, fruits and vegetables, um, maybe a few nuts, but it's primarily produce. But then Lorraine, the owner, has relationships with, say, um, a, a guy in Cape Bay Valley who grows wheat and mills flour. So I can get some flour or I can get rice from Chico Rice. I've even gotten like tofu from a place in Oakland. So, um, you know, it's more than just the, that farm often, you know, they tend to kind of network uh, with their, their buddies and their other farm friends. But it's really um, a great way to buy direct. You get super, super fresh products when you do get a CSA box. Um, it will keep in your fridge much longer than anything you get at a grocery store because it's usually harvested about 24 to 48 hours before you pick it up. Um, so, and it's also a way to really keep the farming economy going. You know, you're kind of investing your dollar into the farm so that they have money up front for the seeds and the fertilizer or whatever it is that they need to, to grow your food. So. It's really a great, it's a great way to, to support a local food system. So yeah, check it, it out. Is. And I, I posted our website. So there's more, there's more about CSAs at sustainableslano.org too, and, and a little directory of sorts too. So yeah. 
And it's so fun because you always get stuff that you never would find in the grocery store or that's new to you. And, um, and so it's a really fun way to taste, um, you know, taste, adv taste explore, <laughs> travel on your taste buds. I don't know. I'm going to just move on to plating here now because as you can tell, I'm getting a little bit punchy. Um, so I mentioned how I have a restaurant background and stuff. So I like to do um, a simple plating. I'm not like doing, you know, tweezer um, kind of like intricacy things here, but this is just the way that I think about when I'm plating is I think about each bite that the person is gonna have and what components are gonna be available to them for that bite because, you know, of course I want every bite to be the perfect bite, but I also want every bite to be just a little bit different so that you don't get tired of just having the same exact flavor for the entire dish. So um, I'm gonna do a little swoosh here with my squash puree. And I don't know if you can see this like beautiful lemony, yellowy lemony color. It's just so pretty. Um, looks good. We can, yeah, from at least on my end, I can see the yellow it looks very vibrant and tasty. Um, and then you kind of cut your beets depending on how you, what size they are and like the shape of them. This guy's pretty small, but I wanted to do like a little shingle-y kind of thing to sort of mimic like, um, I don't know, like a steak or something, I guess. And then always just put a little bit of salt just a tiny little seasoning on top. And I always do just like a tiny little bit of olive oil. You know, you want it to look beautiful. You want it to like jump out and dazzle you and be like shiny and sparkly and say, come and eat me. Um, and then I'm gonna take just some of our greens here that we chiffonaded and, um, and our lemon olive oil. And I'm just gonna spoon it right around here with um, a little squeeze of this lemon. Oops. So this just gives it like a really bright flavor and that little bit of acidity that you want to balance everything. And, you know, always taste that because, um, Again, you want to know what you're putting out on the plate. So I'm just going to do like a little bit there, a little bit here, a little bit here. So it's kind of nestled in there. And then I'm finishing with these really pretty um, pickled cherries. Now they've had a little chance to marinate. And I'll just put them down on something like a board first so that they have a chance to, um, to kind of get some of the liquid out. And then I'll just kind of plop them around here. And if you have any other um, blossoms from your, from your herbs, a lot of times farmers will um, harvest herbs and they'll still have flowers on them. You can put your flowers on top there, but um, this is the dish. Let's see if I can. Mm -hmm. Can you see that? Yeah. So, um, just a simple summery vegetarian dish, and of course you can do more than the one beat. You know, you could do a whole platter, kind of like this, and um, uh, sorry, I just heard a cat. Um, and you know, that you can serve for family style. Sorry guys. Um, so yeah, enjoy. I hope that, um, I hope that you make this at home and I hope that you enjoy it. That's great. Thank you, Andrea. There You're were some, welcome. just some additional comments. Um, yes. one was from Kimber. Hi Kimber. She was really appreciating this because it doesn't have any, or it potentially doesn't have any dairy or soy or corn mm -hmm. and you know, gluten and that sort of thing, but it's 
you know, very rich in terms of the flavor profiles um, and just how you're mixing it together. So that's oh, good. great. Thank you. Um, well. So before everybody goes, I'm going to post in the chat um, our survey link. Hold on, bear with me, people. Copy, I'm copying and pasting. Um, if you have been with us before, you know about this. So it really helps us with our reporting. So please take the survey. It's fairly brief, I think around five questions. Um, and uh, just to kind of gauge, you know, how much you guys are buying and eating some of these ingredients, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, there's actually a couple other quick questions that came up here. Um, yes. Okay, what about posting the recipe? So yes, the recipe is actually already posted um, on sustainablesolano.org. So you'll go to the local food page and then from there scroll down and then you'll get to um, the little dot in the middle. It has a recipe link underneath it. So that is up there. And then someone else is actually asking what meat would you add or pair with this dish? Duck breast from Liberty Farms, um, <laughs> like one of my absolute favorites. Not, they're not, uh, actually, you know what? I, I think they might do some of their farming in Solano County. Um, I don't think it's 100% in Sonoma. Do you know that, Stephanie? I feel like, uh, yeah, Liberty, you know, I, I wanna say that maybe Eat Well was actually mm. linking up with I know that they had a partnership with a duck farm. They were trying to get the duck out to the CSA subscribers during COVID. And um, yeah, I possibly, I don't know if it's the, yeah. the right one, but it could be. The name is sounding familiar to me. So if, that, that could be it. Um, yeah. If you find it. Yeah, other poultry like chicken would be delicious with this. Um, I, I think beef, would be probably a little bit strange with um, with the squash puree, mm -hmm. but with the beet or with the beef the beet puree, um, beef is delicious. Any kind of steak, really grilled, or if you have a cast iron skillet and you do it on there, butter basted with garlic and herbs, like really really good with beet puree and beets. Um, or if you omitted the beets or cut them up like really small in like a really small dice and made sort of like a kind of salsa, if you will, um, out of like the beets with the cherries. I think that would be really nice over um, the squash puree with like um, a pan roasted fish, like um, any like salmon, um, halibut, like I did the other day, um, mm -hmm. you know, trout, a lot of fish options that I'm not, that I'm leaving out, but you know, I think that would be really good. I think the important thing to think of is that the squash puree is really bright and summery and kind of tart. And then the beets are like really earthy and kind of heavy. So if you're thinking about balancing the flavors on the plate, you could like, you know, you want to kind of match those levels, if that makes sense. 